Yes, my predecessors have turned to the future, and there's going to be much to discuss about their, their uh, presentations as well as subsequent ones. Um, I will, for this purpose, stick to the past and two specific times in Ukrainian studies that come out of my own experience. That is, uh, uh, when I am involved and eventually wind up as a graduate student at Harvard f uh, during the time of the formation of the Ukrainian Research Institute there, and when I come to CIUS in 1990 for the short period, 1990-1993. And my first topic is what I will call legitimizing Ukrainian studies in the U.S. This has already been mentioned earlier in our presentations, but I think it's essential for understanding what the Harvard Institute meant and what that project brought about. Now, I would first like to start with the issue of emigre scholarly institutions. And I think we have a tendency too much to rush into universities and mainstreaming into North American academia and sometimes forget how great their contribution was. That is, the 1950s and 60s, at least in the New York metropolitan area where I grew up, was a time when the Ukrainian Free Academy of Sciences for, was formed, the Shevchenko Scientific Society uh, is reestablished in the U.S., uh, the Boundbrook Center, where the church, is, as a memorial to the Holodomor, or Great Famine as we called it, is being built. And I would add one more institution associated with the emigration, but I think wisely funded by the CIA, and that was Prologue. That is, the Prologue offices that put out the current digest of the Soviet Ukrainian press. That is, by the time my consciousness comes into these fields, and that's in the mid-1960s, you had a vibrant, intellectual, academic Ukrainian life going on because of these institutions. And I would argue they provided a counter-narrative to what most of what academia was doing. Uh, they were certainly were institutions that were reaching out. Not only did the Prologue put out the current digest of the Soviet Ukrainian press in English, but after all, Uvan was able to put out the annals of the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences, which for that period in time produced much of the valuable literature in English. And uh, I think later, if we would like to talk about that emigre phase and what it meant, uh, I think it would be valuable. It would be a valuable topic. Now, what were Ukrainian studies academically, at least in the U.S.? And here, Canada and the U.S. are very different. That is, Ukrainian language and literature was taught starting with the 1940s in Saskatchewan. They already had a place in Canada. And also, the, just the virtual existence of this large number of people not speaking English in the Canadian West meant that we already have in that first early Ukrainian English dictionary that's put out in Winnipeg. You had to be aware in Canada that Ukrainian was a language because they had to deal with the Ukrainian community, much less so in the US. Ukrainian studies in the US were largely Sovietology. Uh, they were in political science departments. We think of the early phase of professors Adams, Armstrong, Sullivan, Reshetar, Belinsky putting out their books, and Ukrainian research on Ukraine could find a place as long as it fit in Sovietology. I remind you that Soviet history did not exist in the 1950s and 60s. Almost everywhere, information on the Soviet Union was taught in political science or government departments. It would only later move to history departments uh, when it became a historical topic. Even in my own career as a Princeton undergraduate, I wrote a thesis at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and Sociology on the Contemporary Ukrainian Intelligentsia of the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Bob Magochi can comment as a graduate student in history later, but I would have had a much harder time going to Cyril Black or James Billington, our professors of history, as an undergraduate with a historical topic. I bring that up because it also shows why the, the model that Omeyan Pritzak ca comes up with turns out, I don't think it was conceived of such, to meet very much the needs of what Ukrainian legitimization needed in North America. That is uh, the formation of uh, what might be called a traditional research agenda. Now it came about this history, language, and literature initiative, at least by urban legend, and I'm trying to verify this, because the student, Ukrainian Student Association of New York University around the mid-1950s asked that Ukrainian language be taught, and the then, I assume, Russian, if not Slavic department responded that we teach languages, not dialects. And this was the stimulus to the student association beginning the so-called 
von Cathedra Kornelzaus to a search. Now, I don't know, I w do not sell this as necessarily true, but it does convey, I think, attitudinally the situation at that time. And as we know, it was Susta and the Studenska Hromada that begins the, the Kolyada for the Ukrainian chair that by the mid-1960s had raised $250,000, largely to form what they saw as a needed chair in Ukrainian studies that would at least give things Ukrainian some recognition. Now, it's at that point in time, probably Columbia was the university, or was the university they had thought of doing it. By that time, George Shevelyov is at Columbia. It might have gone to Columbia, but as we know, for a number of reasons it does not, not least of which was that at that point, a chair at Columbia cost $900,000 and one at Harvard, $600,000. Harvard was a bargain in those days. Uh, but it really was Omeyan Pritzak and his suggestions, which were definitely for a European research institute, three traditional chairs, in many ways meeting both the pattern of the Shevchenko Scientific Society where he had begun his scholarly career and the concepts of chairs at universities that go, go back to Austrian times, it wins out. As well, it was to have a journal, it was to carry on research projects. That was, it was eminently non-American in its conceptualization. And all, at Harvard, because of, I think, the, uh, the fact that professors uh, in those days particularly had tremendous latitude within the university, he was able in many ways to carry this out, although it didn't terribly well meet the structures he was part of. But it did have one great success, and one I would bring up. Uh, in 1970, I believe, Franklin Ford, dean of the university, writes to Omelian Pritzak, I have that letter which says, we have been all, st we are ab amazed at how you have shown that Ukrainian studies is a way of understanding world history of, uh, and world affairs. You have you've shown it's not a narrow field. Uh, Franklin Ford, I might add, one of the uh, things that uh, I found very troublesome is, uh, in fact, a PhD from this university, Per Rudling, once wrote that the problem with Ukrainian studies were the existence of the two ethnic institutes, CIUS and, and Harvard. And I thought of how much that Harvard Institute, as it was formed, was something to reach far beyond any ethnicity in the way that both Pritzak and Shevchen Shevchenko conceptualized it. Did it have impacts that were important? Yes, I think many. Although the dean uh, didn't get quite the history of the Ukraine Rus down uh, earlier in, in the section, uh, one topic I can bring up, and I, Paul Hollingsworth, who was at Harvard, points out how in his own career at Berkeley, reading the material from Harvard made him rethink Kiev in Russia and make it Kiev in the Rus. That is, uh, there were periods on the early uh, medieval and early modern period where it had great impact. Certainly the journal did. It also was embedded in an entire world of Ukrainian academics throughout the U.S. and in Canada. There were scores. I, we could count them up by checking the Ukrainian Professors Association uh, uh, numbers of academics who were associated with Harvard. They no longer exist. And Bob uh, Magochi has very well brought out the collapse of the academic market that brings us to Canada, and therefore in my three minutes left I can come to my arriving at CIUS in 1990. Okay, I come into CIUS at a point where the Institute had much benefited by the multiculturalism policy. I arrived in 1991 for the centennial of the Ukrainian uh, immigration or community of Canada. And one of the first events I took part in, uh, because Bogdan Krauchenko, who is missing today, also then left immediately on arrival. And for two years, I was the acting director of the Institute. Hence, this is sort of my period of time of dealing with it. Uh, we had a, at the Provincial Museum, a huge lecture for the Shevchenko lecture of then an active Peas and Bees Club, where William Thorsell got up and basically said, forget this multiculturalism nonsense. You know, I, I spent my life stopped being Norwegian. So it was an interesting moment, I thought, because you had then the, who was to be the editor of the Globe and Mail, telling a hometown community that he didn't believe in this. It was also the time when Mulroney came to Edmonton for the centennial of the, of the immigration, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Ukrainian community basically uh, made a fait accompli by giving him a letter from the Ukrainian government we arranged asking for recognition of Ukraine. But it was also a high point of, uh, of I think, that contact of that, what was the organized community that Professor Lupul discussed. 
was a period when a number of grand projects were coming to an end, above all the Encyclopedia of Ukraine. So the Institute was in totally involved, particularly as Toronto office, but we had to read 50 pages a day of that encyclopedia. So it was ending a period of, of what might be called pioneer projects. But it was a time when just after the matching, a double match program of Alberta, the Institute was getting a large number of endowments, the largest of them being the Yatsik Center that brought me here, but it was not only that. The Institute was trans transforming, in a way, to a new source of funding, which proved in the 1990s to be extremely important, above all because when cuts hit the university, it somewhat cushioned the Institute. Now, uh, what I would argue that happens out of all this is a period which I will call the pivot to Ukraine. That is, in practice, the Institute became very involved with Ukraine and it shaped it for its future. Uh, we had tremendous freedom in those days to work in Ukraine. And we are grateful to the University of Alberta administration of those days, above all the research office, uh, Vice President Research Office, that they, they encouraged us to, to be involved in this and to do at these times. Remember, these are the days when you had to put money in a pocket and take it to Ukraine. There was no way to transfer money, to find ways that we could do things very rapidly. And we also had assistance from many institutions. Some of our big successes of those days, when I talk about, we, t we talked about what it meant for Ukraine. We, we brought 20 or 30 scholars, historians from Ukraine within two years to go to Warsaw to work in archives and libraries and see how normal academia works, getting out, you know, uh, getting out of it. We, uh, we fund the Institute for Historical Research out of the Mr. Stelmach's money that comes. And we also recontact, particularly with, with people like Professors Dashkevich and Nisayevich, um, that make, in some ways, Lviv a center of our activity. I, I would discuss later whether this was a good strategy. I think it was. We, above all, have the arrival of Serhii Ploki who is our link to Ukraine for those years, uh, from then on for the next 15, but brought from another Ukraine, from, from what we now will call, I guess, central Ukraine, it's no longer eastern Ukraine, uh, coming from uh, then Dnipropetrovsk. Uh, and we have these new projects, such as the Ruzhevsky project, which now are not undertaken in isolation from people in Ukraine. If the institutes in both Harvard and CAUS had become international in outreach earlier, they become Ukraine connected in this period. I cannot picture how we would have gotten, we've now got, got nine of the what are going to be 12 volumes of Ruzhevsky out. We couldn't have done it without scholars in Ukraine now. And what I find is a wonderful symbiosis is I was just at a Ruzhevsky conference in Keio and I was told that they will be using our English version as a model for a new edition of Ruzhevsky's History of Ukraine Rus. That is all the work we've done on bibliographies, footnotes, new material is now going to be put to use there in a new edition. I, yes, I argue that today, uh, and this was also the period when we got new constituencies, both government, media, it provided new opportunities, but also new demands on the Institute, some of which it met, I think, quite well in the 1990s and into the 21st century, others of which it had more problems in meeting. Thank you.